Hi, greetings everyone. My name is Allison Flepton. I work with the Reading Within Reach initiative, which supports the Global Reading Network. We're happy to bring you our third webinar in our series on early great reading program design and implementation, best practices and resources for success. Thank you for joining us from the many corners around the world that we can see you've logged in from. So this professional development series was developed by REACH, which is funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development and implemented by a university research company, or URC. Um, as many of you may know, REACH supports the Global Reading Network, which is a community of practice whose aim is to help develop and share resources, um, test out innovations, and support a global community discussion on how we best improve the teaching and learning of early grade reading, particularly in low and middle income countries. If you're not familiar with REACH and the Global Reading Network, you can visit our website where you'll also find many resources and you can sign up to get our newsletter and periodic communications about um, events and resources that are available. This webinar series that we're running in November was developed through a collaboration with members of the Global Reading Network. They provided substantial input into the content, and they also shared many resources from their programs. So we acknowledge all of those inputs, um, and we'll be sharing all of the materials from this webinar and others on our website shortly after the webinars are done. I'd like to just uh, call your attention to the blue box where we have a list of the different presenters throughout the month. We're excited today to have Adrian Barnes from Florida State University, as well as our guest, Young Suk Kim from California, who is um, supporting the Global Reading Network on some white papers on structured pedagogy and formative assessment. And she'll be collaborating with Adrian today to share with you um, some of the best practices and uh, approaches to that in early grade reading programs. So the purpose of this um, development, professional development series is to provide all of you with a summary of evidence-based information about topics related to early grade reading, to share some guidance and best practices that programs have learned throughout the past several years of implementing early grade reading programs and to share with you some resources so that we're not all reinventing the wheel or looking on our own, but we have now a curated set of resources that can be valuable to people across programs and countries. So each of our sessions is focusing on a key technical topic. Some of you may have joined us last week where we had an engaging discussion on the development of teaching and learning materials for programs. Um, and through those different topics, we are sharing research, experiences, and best practices, as I've mentioned. We also are touching on a number of cross-cutting issues as we go through these topical sessions. We know that these are important to integrate throughout, and that's why they are not standalone sessions. We're looking at issues of gender equity, how technology can support early grade reading programs and the different facets of them, and also how we can make our programs inclusive from the design phase right away so that we are really reaching all children. We also look at issues of monitoring evaluation, which we know we need to always um, integrate throughout the design and implementation if we want to better understand what is working. And we are also talking about how design and implementation can be done in such a way that we're always thinking about scale up and the sustainability of our program. Um, throughout the webinar series, we have done our best to uh, uh, integrate opportunities for interaction, questions and comments. We realize just by the nature of a webinar, we, we are not all in a room to have this discussion, but we feel that we have a lot to learn from each other. And so we have, um, throughout the webinar, you'll see opportunities to share and ask questions. Um, so the webinars we've already had the past couple of weeks were an introduction to early grade reading improvement, um, which gave a broad overview of the different components of programs and also situated them within the context of the global movement for improving learning including the Sustainable Development Goals and USAID's efforts to support basic education internationally and their new um, strategy on international basic education and reading in particular. And last Tuesday, we looked at resources for teaching and learning. And the session one materials are available on our website and the ones from the session two should be available today or tomorrow and an email will go out to the whole Global Reading Network once those are. Today's session, as you all know, is early grade reading skills and strategies for effective instruction and assessment. And then as we go through the second half of the month, we, we invite you to register for the upcoming ones on language, teacher professional development and coaching, and from conception to scale, program design, expansion, and sustainability. And here you see the URL to do so. So I'd like now to segue 
to our presentation today, which will be led by Dr. Adrian Barnes. Dr. Barnes is a literacy and pedagogy specialist at the Learning Systems Institute at Florida State University. She has more than 17 years of experience in education environments, um, including in American schools and in the international education field. Her current endeavors include supporting the USAID Nigeria Northern Education Initiative Plus project, another USAID initiative in Nigeria, Nigeria at Bayer University, which is a partnership with FSU in Kano State, and UNICEF in Nigeria supporting the adaptation of early grade materials for the Kanuri language. She's also working in Honduras, supporting a reading activity there. Dr. Barnes has supported um, REACH's efforts on training and professional development for the past several months, including this webinar series. She's taught elementary school and then received her master's and doctorate from FSU in 2011 and 2015. She's currently a fellow with the Florida Center for Reading Research. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Young Suk Kim is also contributing to this presentation today. She's a professor at the University of California at Irvine. Before joining the faculty there, she was an associate professor of education and associate director of the Florida Center for Reading Research at FSU. She received her doctorate at Harvard University in human development and psychology with a concentration on language and literacy. She holds a master's degree in teaching English to speakers of other languages, as well as in human development and culture. She was a former classroom teacher at the primary, at primary and secondary schools and a community college in San Francisco, California. So we welcome both our presenters and we'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. Barnes. Okay, good morning. And uh, th like I said, thank you for joining us. Um, during this webinar, we are going to d be discussing effective skills, strategies, and approach approaches and activities for teaching early grade reading and writing. We're also going to be talking about classroom-based assessment to inform instruction and general considerations when planning, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating instruction. So I'd like to take, I'd like to begin by taking a few moments and if you would just, you know, maybe put a few comments in Zoom, things that you're, oh, pardon me, things that you're thinking about, questions that you have, even as we go. Um, if you could send all of your questions to all attendees and panelists, um, that would allow us to continue the discussion, answer your questions, and maybe uh, support some collaboration between attendees. So on the left-hand side, you see a blue box that lists all of the basic skills related to literacy. And why do we look at these skills? Well, research has indicated that these are the skills that are critical to teach across all languages, across all contexts. These are the basic skills that lead to literacy. Now, there are specific considerations in different languages that may influence how some of those skills are taught or how much time is being spent teaching them. But effective programs include instruction in each of these skills and effective programs should also address the needs of all the students. As we talk about instruction, we're really talking about all of the learning activities, everything that teachers use, as well as the ways that teachers support students in discovering knowledge and learning skills. Because teaching isn't necessarily about giving them the information, it's about showing them how to find the information on their own by teaching them skills of, of how to learn. So why does effective early instruction matter? Because research indicates that when students fall behind in early reading skills in the early grades, they continue to be behind. So they do not actually catch up. They fall further behind with each passing year. And this is called the Matthew effect, where the rich continue to get richer and the poor stay poor. The reason this happens is because children that learn those skills early begin reading earlier and then begin learning from what they read and strengthening those skills at a faster pace than those children who do not receive effective instruction early. So I'd like to take a moment, um, about five minutes, and if you could just draw this on a piece of paper, this KWL chart. Before we really get into the meat of the presentation, I'd like you to take a few moments 
and under the K, list the things that you already know about early grade literacy, how, they, how children need to be taught, how these skills should be implemented. And then under the W, list what you want to get out of this presentation, what you want to know about early grade literacy skills, how they should be taught, and how children need to learn them. And I'll give you about five minutes to kind of jot down your ideas about what you already know and what you'd like to know. So let's start by talking about language skills, right? Language skills begin uh, very early in life when children are still at home. Um, and, they and children come to school with very different levels of oral language skills, right? Research has shown that their language skills when they come to school are strongly predictive of later reading comprehension skills and their language skills across the lifetime. So it's very important for ch children to know an extensive range of vocabulary, know how those words are meaningfully used in words and sentences, how to construct complex sentences, how to respond. And teachers can support this by providing opportunities to talk in small and large group settings, by encouraging those higher order thinking skills, by getting the children involved in discussions in the classroom where they're providing their opinion or their view, talking about topics to build their background knowledge, doing storytelling activities. So we want to hear those students talking in the classroom. When the children are silent in the classroom and they're listening to the teacher, they're not building their expressive language skills. As they begin expressing, we want to ask questions to elicit a, a longer response or a more elaborate response. We request clarification or we encourage them to maybe uh, express more of, of what they're thinking or to think, think broader about the topic they're talking about. We do this naturally with our own children as we're raising them. And so we need teachers to do that in the classroom as well. A language rich environment is, is quite important for early readers, particularly for children who come to school with low levels of language skills. Now, concepts of print. When we talk about concepts of print, we're talking about the understanding of how print and books work, right? We don't automatically know to pick up a book and turn it right side up and make sure that for English speakers that the pages, you know, the book opens from right to left and we turn pages from right to left, that we read text starting at the top left of the page and then we read to the right and from top to bottom. All of these things have to be taught, right? And so when children first come to school, oftentimes they have very limited experiences with print and working with books. So part of a high quality early grade literacy program includes instruction in concepts of print. What is the purpose of print? That print carries a meaning that the story is in the words and not the pictures, that words are made up of letters, that those letters can be different sizes and different shapes, that the uppercase and the lowercase letter of, of the same letter are the same letter, but in uppercase and lowercase, um, that we read either left to right and top to bottom, or, you know, like in Arabic, you would teach that they read right to left. And then, what is the front cover of the book? Where's the back cover? What's the title of the book? Who is the author of the book? What does the author do for a book? So all of these things are things that young readers need to learn as they're being introduced to books. Some children may come to school having already had a plethora of experiences from their home environment, and that's ideal. But in contexts across the world, we see children who have a very weak home literacy environment. So teachers have to supplement that. They have to show children how books are cared for and how books are treated. A child's awareness of print and their ability to recognize that the, the message is in the print is the initial step towards learning how to read. So phonological and phonemic awareness is an interesting skill because 
we need children to be aware of language and aware of the sounds of language and the sounds within their language as they, as they learn to read. Phonological awareness begins with recognizing that the speech stream is not just a, an, an unending stream. Um, children often think that a phrase is, is it's just a whole word, right? So we have to teach them that sentences are made up of individual words. And then words are made up of syllables and parts. And maybe teach them how to identify and, and produce maybe rhyming words. And um, then move on to individual sounds. Now, not every language is um, alphabetic, right? So for syllabic languages, you only have to work down to the syllable level. But for alphabetic languages, where a single letter represents a single sound, we have to build that phonological awareness all the way down to the phonemic level, where they can recognize the individual sounds in words. Or, and and this, this skill of identifying those sounds supports their understanding of the alphabetic principle when we start teaching them about letters. So when we do phonological awareness instruction and phonemic awareness instruction, there are no letters, there's no printed text, we're not talking about letters and the sounds that letters make, we're only listening for the sounds in words and looking at pictures. And I have a video that I'd like to show. Okay, boys and girls, today we are going to play a game. We're going to be reviewing all the fun things we've been learning about sounds in words. And today we're going to play a game, and we're going to pick out some objects, and we're going to count the sounds that we hear in those objects, okay? I'm going to do it first, and I want you to watch me, okay? And then you're going to do it, okay? Okay. All right, we're going to look in here. If it's not looking, we're going to dig down in here and find something. <gasps> I got a log. Say it with me. Log. log. Now let's count the sounds we hear. Log. Wonderful. Very good. We had three, so I'm going to put it over here in our three basket. Okay? Let's have Shannon come up here. Have a seat in our seat. Dig down in there and find something. Get something quickly. What did you get? A dog. Let's say it with her. Dog. dog. Let's sound it, count the sounds. Dog. How many? Three. three. Can you put it in our three basket? Very good. Thank you. Okay, let's have Jemaya. Dig down in there and find something. What did you get? Lion. Lion. Let's say it with her. Lion. Lion. Let's sound, count the sounds. Lion. Four. Put in our four basket. That was tricky. That was a little tricky. Austin, come up here and pick something. No. What'd you get? Nest. Let's say it with him. Ready? Nest. Nest. Let's count it. Nest. Four. four. Put it in our four basket. Today's activity that we did was isolating sounds, which is very important for phonemic awareness. Um, this activity they can do together um, as a whole group, or they can do it by themselves in a center. This activity is hands-on, and the kids really enjoy doing this activity with their friends in centers. So this type of instruction really helps the students cue into the individual sounds in the individual sounds in the words. And the reason that that's important is because for alphabetic languages, if they're aware of those individual sounds, then they're, then they're going to be able to begin, pardon me, they're going to be able to begin um, associating letters with those sounds, right? So if they know that hen is three sounds, eh, mm, they know that H makes the sound and they can assign H to that. E is represented by the E and N is represented by the letter N. So building that phonemic awareness really, really strengthens and supplements phonics instruction. 
And oftentimes when we have children who are failing to learn phonics and they're failing to do these very simple types of activities with word families and they, they can't do like, like you see on the screen now, oftentimes it's because they lack phonemic awareness. So when we have struggling readers and, and they're just failing to learn how to read, the first line of defense is to go back and provide phonemic awareness instruction and make sure that those children are truly phonologically aware because that is that skill is phonics is dependent upon that skill for them to actually be able to learn the letter sound correlations. Now when we teach phonics, we teach it for both decoding, which is reading the words going from print to print to words, and also encoding, which is going from words to print. And as we teach children to decode, we want to teach them these word families so that as they see the same spelling pattern, they, they already know how to say that word. They don't have to work to try to decode it. But then we also are going to come across some words that they can't decode, like elephant or poaching. Maybe it's in a story they're reading. So sometimes we just teach words as a sight word, not as a decodable word. And when we're teaching words, we want to make sure that we're really focusing on having one skill per lesson, providing instruction and review with brief lessons. So phonics lessons are like 10 minute lessons. They're not long lessons. You want to get the children practicing and acting and getting them working together with decodable texts that support phonics skills. Um, I understand that in the resources webinar, you're going to learn about decodable texts and how they're developed, but basically decodable texts are texts that the children can read based on the phonics patterns they've already learned. So as they learn a phonics pattern, they need to spend time reading connected text that applies that phonics skill and that pattern. We also want to link phonics to spelling, right? Because as they're reading, they should also be writing. Any phonics patterns as they learn them, they should be exposed to reading texts that support the, the learning of that phonics pattern. But they should also be writing those words and writing sentences with those words or writing their ideas. And we'll talk about writing a little bit later. But right now, I'd like you to take a few moments and Zoom chat with us. Talk about... How have you seen any or all of these skills we've addressed so far? Oral language, concepts of print, phonological or phonemic awareness, or phonics integrated into primary curriculum? And specifically, I'd like you to think about when you've seen it or when you've seen lesson plans, were the teachers lecturing or were the pupils practicing? And what are your ideas on how teachers can provide more effective instruction? Okay, oral language, the use of pictures and textbooks. Okay, great. So oral language is a really great, using pictures, using picture cards or posters is a really great way to get children discussing or, you know, even talking about an idea or a topic. Locally made materials. Um, I would like to talk about that very briefly because as you're teaching phonics, um, you may want the children to have like manipulatives like letter cards or something in their hands to move the letters around. And one of the greatest things that I've seen is using the bottle tops, either the, the metal uh, like Coca-Cola pop tops or the plastic water bottle tops and just writing the letter on there with, with a, a magic marker, or a permanent marker, and making that a manipulative for the children to move around. Songs are really, really great, right? Songs are great for developing that phonological awareness when you're doing rhyming words. Um, and then you can move into some phonics instruction when you start talking about the letters like A says ah. Even though you don't have like text in front of you, that's still technically phonics because you're, you're integrating the letter. But that builds letter sound correlation and understanding. Adrian, this is Allison. We had a lot of people mention songs have been used to as a way of teaching. Right, songs are songs are very very good, and 
you know, they're very popular with young children. It's something fun that you can get them standing up and moving their whole body. And, you know, research shows that when your body is moving, your, your brain is working and you're, you're learning. So using songs, using body movements with those songs, um, those are all really great strategies. Kinesthetic activities, yes, that's awesome. I see two questions around phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. One, if you could just um, try to differentiate them again for, for everyone, what exactly is the difference between phonological awareness and phonemic difference uh, awareness? And then a follow-up question on explaining how those skills um, relate to alphasyllabic languages. Okay, sure. Um, so phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is part of phonological awareness. So when we talk about phonological awareness, that's clapping the words in a sentence, that's finding words that rhyme, that's segmenting words into syllables, that's all phonological awareness. And so is phonemic awareness. But phonemic awareness means that you're working with the individual sounds. So saying, um, uh, I went to the store, right, is phonological awareness, but st or, st or, like the, breaking it down to the individual sounds is, is phonemic awareness. It's like a very refined form of phonological awareness. And you only need to go down to that level if in, in the language being taught, a letter represents a sound. If a grapheme or um, a symbol represents a syllable and not an individual sound, then you don't have to do phonemic awareness down to the individual sounds. Right, you can just stick with phonological awareness, work at the syllable level, because that's really the level that the children will need to um, learn to read and decode and, and write in code with. Um, phonemic awareness, is it the same with letter sound awareness? So phonemic awareness is very related to letter sound awareness. Letter sound awareness is basically phonics, and the difference between phonemic awareness and phonics is the presence of letters. So if I say to you orally, the word is man, man has three sounds, n, a, n, that's phonemic awareness. But if I say the word is man, it has three sounds, n is represented by m, a is represented by a, and n is represented by n, then it turns into phonics. So, but that phonological and phonemic awareness is sort of like a precursor. Being aware is a precursor to being able to apply the letters. And that's why if the, if the child is not able to apply those letters and, and do the phonics activity, you back up and you provide more instruction in phonemic awareness with the aural and the oral sounds. And so the important thing for teachers, right, the important thing is helping them understand that the sounds come before the letters and that they link together. So you teach the sounds, you teach the phono phonological and phonemic awareness, and then you link it into the letters. And then when you're presenting the letters, the children already have a basis of knowledge. And then if they have difficulty, you go back to the phonological and phonemic awareness. So we have to get our teachers kind of understanding what that is and, and how to address it. So let's move forward. Let's move on to spelling, right? Because after they start learning letters, after they start learning phonics patterns, we start teaching them spelling patterns, right? We want to we teach spelling using patterns because we want to build on success. So we encourage children to look for patterns, help them um, relate unknown words. We help them look for patterns in unknown words. Lots and lots of activities in the classroom, opportunities to practice writing those words incorporating words from reading lessons, from their um, phonics lessons. We can use word cards for activities, as many of the things that were listed for phonics go into spelling too. We can encourage students to find new words in their environment. Um, they could use word, word study notebooks. Word, we can post word walls. We encourage them to discover patterns in their reading um, and in their writing um, and help them relate this pattern when they when they come to unknown words or they want to write a word that they don't know how to spell 
encourage them to kind of think about what patterns do I already know? What, what strategies do I already have in place? And uh, later on, I'll show you a word wall that's kind of a vocabulary and spelling word wall that's a really great idea to use in the classroom. Um, so vocabulary, right? Um, it's important for teachers to know that the words we teach for spelling are different than the words we teach for vocabulary. Because the words we teach for spelling are related to reading instruction. The words we teach for vocabulary are related to oral language development and sometimes writing instruction, but writing as expressive language. Um, so when we present words, the single most important thing about presenting vocabulary words to children is that we give them the definition first. We don't want to say, oh, the word is automobile. What do you think automobile looks, or what do you think automobile means? Because children tend to fast map, and if they hear the wrong definition the first time they hear that word, oftentimes that's the definition that they remember. So we begin, an automobile is something that carries people from one place to another. And on the right side of the screen, you can see it's called the Freyer model. And it says, you know, there's the definition, there's the description, what is it like? It has wheels, doors, a windshield, seats, and a steering wheel. And then on the bottom, you see both examples and non-examples. Because we want children to kind of identify, okay, well, what are vehicle or what are, what are modes of transportation that are automobiles and modes of transportation that are not automobiles? So a van, a car, and a bus are all automobiles but a plane, a boat, and a motorcycle are not automobiles, even though they may have wheels, doors, a windshield, seats, and a steering wheel, right? So we wanna make sure that we provide both examples and non-examples for children. Um, graphic organizers like that are really, really awesome for helping children work through word meanings. We wanna review words, um, create word walls, we also want to teach multiple uses for words. How do you use the word in different contexts? Or what are the different meanings that those words have? And then at the bottom, you see a lot list along the bottom where we teach related words. Now, I would, with my students, just give them little word cards that have all of these words that are related. And say, you know, put them on a continuum. Start with, like for these, what's the smallest and what's the largest? And then they work together in groups to kind of figure out that order. It doesn't necessarily matter. Like for all of these, they're all synonyms. They're all very, very similar. It doesn't matter that their order is exactly correct. What matters is that they're working together and they're discussing the meanings of the words. And so one child might say, well, I think giant is bigger than enormous. And another child might say, well, I think enormous is bigger than giant. And because, and then in doing so, they will talk through, well, what does the word giant mean for me versus what does the word enormous mean for me? And then they're going to say, well, a really big tall building might be giant, but I wouldn't call that enormous. And that gives them the opportunity to develop their oral language skills and really work through how they understand these words and what they mean to them. We want to conduct writing activities that involve these new vocabulary words. So as children start learning words, we want them to use them in their oral vocabulary and we want to use them in their writing. And going back to spelling, when they're using them in their writing, if they're for vocabulary purposes, we might have them posted on the wall, but we don't need necessarily need to make sure that they have to spell those correctly. They can be posted on the wall. Use your look and copy strategy. Look on the wall and copy that word down. Because like I said, vocabulary words, the purpose of teaching them is not about spelling. This is about developing language skills. Here are some, um, some really great samples of how teachers can integrate displays of vocabulary trees or word walls into their classrooms for students to see and use those for expanding their word knowledge for engaging in discussions. So you might have either spelling patterns on the wall or you might have like on the right is a vocabulary tree. All the words that are related and how they're related. So like I said, some words need to be taught as sight words and a lot of times those are the vocabulary words. 
We just say, this is the word elephant. When you see it in text, that's the word elephant. That way, as the child is reading, he or she doesn't get stuck trying to sound that word out. They already know it. Because reading fluency is about applying all of the skills that the children have learned thus far as they're reading, right? We want to use decodable text. We want to teach the phonics pattern and then allow the students to sound out the words in a passage. We want to randomly assess isolated words and sentences because memorization is not reading. And if a child reads a passage over and over and over and the whole class reads it together, suddenly they can read it without looking at the page. That's because they've memorized it. Their eyes and their fingers should be on the text as they're reading. And if teachers are concerned that the child has just memorized the text and isn't actually reading, he or she can walk over and point to an individual word or an individual sentence and say, read that word or read that sentence for me. And if the child cannot read that individual word, then the child isn't reading the text. The child has memorized the text. And I think that's really important for us to address because um, in a lot of classrooms, we have a large number of children, and it's difficult to know if every single child is reading the text or is just repeating what they've memorized as they've worked on that text all week. So teachers should go through and randomly assess children. They, they'll know the ones to keep their eyes on. They'll know the ones within a few weeks of school that are going to need more support, that are going to need more guidance. And so randomly assessing their word reading skills, particularly with the decodable text, because then you recognize you're able to see what skills the children have learned and what skills they still need to know. Um, I have another video to show you. This is um, Rwandan students who are partnered together to take turns reading a text. So two, two students are, one or two students are sharing a book, right? And the idea of paired reading is that the students alternate reading quietly to one another. This provides each student with an opportunity to read and also an opportunity to listen to their partner read and follow along and maybe make corrections or give feedback. And in doing so, they're building their own reading skills. So it's, it's very reciprocal. Now, notice that as the children were reading, the teacher was not standing at the front of the class. The teacher was circulating around the class. She was checking to make sure that each child was reading. She was maybe watching their interactions, making sure that they were engaged, making sure that they are paying attention to the text. The children's fingers were on the text so that the teacher could walk up and know exactly what word the child was reading at that point. One question I've received by many, many people is, well, if the child's finger is on the text while they're reading, doesn't that mean that the child is not a good reader? And my response to that is absolutely not. Because when the child's text is, finger is on the text, the child's attention is on the text. And if that finger is touching each word as the child reads, then the eyes are looking at the word, the brain is looking at the word, and the child is reading the word. In addition, a teacher or a peer can walk up and know exactly where that child is and listen to them read each word. And if they're doing that, then they are not memorizing the text. So high levels of fluency are, are indicative of comprehension. But I'm going to drop back and talk about listening comprehension before I talk about reading comprehension. Because earlier we had a really good discussion about how phonemic awareness supports phonics instruction and the alphabetic principle. Because when children are able to seg segment sounds and play with the sounds of a language orally and aurally, then they're able to apply those skills to text. 
with letters. So the same is true with comprehension skills, right? Children need to learn listening comprehension skills before they learn reading comprehension skills because reading comprehension is just doing the same types of activities with text. Listening comprehension is easier for children than reading comprehension because you don't have the text element, right? So comprehension, this is, you know, finding the meaning in what we hear and understanding the message. And these listening comprehension skills are the basis for reading comprehension skills. A child is only able to apply comprehension skills to a text if they can already apply those comprehension skills to oral language situations. Therefore, we need children to practice their comprehension skills in oral language settings. We need to develop their listening comprehension using read-alouds or discussions and ask them to retell stories or recall details or predict what they think is going to happen next because in order to correctly predict what's happening next, you have to already know what has, you have to know what has already happened. And you have to understand it very well in order to make a prediction about what's going to happen. We also want to encourage children to analyze problems and solutions, to respond to questions about the text. And one way that you can do this as listening comprehension and, and this is like a, this is a, a segue, like a ladder. This is a, a way to get to the written part, right? So you're doing these listening comprehension activities, and maybe you have some gloves like this. They don't have to be exactly like this, but notice that on the narrative you see, oh, hey, what were the characters in that story? Who were the characters in that story? And the setting, what, where did that story take place? And the problem, what was the problem that the characters were experiencing or the goal of their story and how did they solve that problem? What were the events that happened in the story? What were some main ideas or what was your favorite part? All of those things, if you start with like a glove and you can do it with expository also, you start with the oral language skills and you develop that and this glove is a way to start talking about it and identifying all of those specific parts of the story or parts of the informational text, which can lead to using a graphic organizer and writing that information down. And the reason I show you this is because this student wrote some information down and then developed some uh, short paragraphs on the topic, right? And if children are able to do this, right, they're able to talk about the story, they're able to retell the story, and then they're able to maybe write down or draw pictures, even if they can't write yet, of, of the stories and the text that they're reading, then they have a better chance of being able to do it on their own when they're reading a story. Because like I said, reading comprehension is based on their listening comprehension. And if they can complete comprehension activities in a listening environment with oral language, then they're prepared to be able to start applying that to text. Skilled readers often forget that comprehension takes effort. So we, as skilled readers and adults, we don't appreciate that there are complex skills required for understanding text. We have to bring in the reader's prior knowledge, their experience, their levels of vocabulary. All of these things impact reading comprehension. Um, now, that phonological and phonemic awareness that leads to phonics skills and fluency and vocabulary all of that is kind of comes to fruition when we look at reading comprehension because any of those other skills that are weak will inhibit a child's ability to comprehend what they read in some instance or another. And that takes us to writing. I mentioned earlier that when we have children um, engaging in phonics lessons, we also uh, we also want them writing, right? We want them writing words. We want them writing sentences. We want them writing those patterns. But we also want children writing about what they're learning, right? As soon as they're able to start writing words, we want them to practice encoding, which means writing words that they know. And writing 
fully supports comprehension, right? It's an interactive process. It's a reciprocal relationship between comprehension and writing. And when I say that writing supports comprehension, I'm not talking about copying letters or doing handwriting exercises or copying sentences from the board. The type of writing that supports reading comprehension is self-expression. Taking their ideas, putting those ideas in an organized fashion, and then writing those down on paper because it makes it solid. It makes it, um, it makes them really think through and own it. And it, it. and it helps them organize their ideas and really understand what they know and what they don't know. And we should be using the writing process with children, um, brainstorming, drafting, revising, editing, publishing uh, in the primary school. So um, there's a really, there's, you know, there's research that supports that writing instruction supports reading instruction or writing skills support reading skills. Um, you know, writing is the expressive form of reading. And so we want our children to be getting involved in doing those writing exercises that support comprehension. Um, I have a, an activity here, but I'd like to take a moment to answer any questions that have come up or uh, anything else that's come up in the chat. Adrian, could you clarify a bit the issue of sight words and decodable words? Um, somebody asked if some sight words are decodable, um, and if you could maybe address that. Some sight words can be decodable. There, there are really two definitions for sight words. The first definition is a sight word for a child is any word that they are not currently able to decode. So it could be um, that it could be decodable, but maybe they just haven't learned that spelling pattern yet. Um, so that could be a sight word, or it could be a word that is never going to be decodable, like the word the. If you try to sound out T H E, it's you know in your grade one. It's going to be difficult because t -e does not say the. Um, and the, and there, are, there are a number of words that you know, we teach as sight words because they're not really decodable. But yes, sight words can be decodable. It could just be that the child doesn't know how to sound that word out yet. That's one definition. But another definition, <clears throat> as children get older, sight words also refer to any of the words that a child can recognize immediately in reading and not have to decode. So usually in early grades, like grades one, two, and three, when we talk about sight words, we're talking about that first definition, the words that are either not decodable or the child has not learned the, the phonics pattern or the skills to decode that word. And then when we talk about older grade ch children, older grade students and their sight word vocabulary, we're talking about all of the sight words, that all the words they know by sight and don't need to try to decode. Um, so hopefully that kind of explains that. Allison, were there any other questions? Yeah, thank you. We also had a question on what is the criteria for concluding that a child reads text fluently? Um, it's a continuum, right? It's a continuum. And so that goes into, that also leads into what are the benchmarks and targets for the specific language? But typically, when we think of a fluent reader, a fluent reader is a reader who, when they're reading, it sounds like they're talking to you, not like they're reading a text. So, uh, and like the number of words per minute or the number of words that are correct is going to be dependent upon, like I said, the language and there are contextual factors there. But ultimately, a fluent reader sounds like they're talking to you. And, you know, anyone who likes to listen to books on tape, that's great examples of a really fluent reader because that, that reader, it sounds like they're just talking to us over the, over the audio and that we, we don't really know. We know they're reading because we know there's a text, but if you were to just listen to it, it would sound like someone speaking to you. Yeah, and if you'd like to see an example of that, the Global Reading Network's website has some really nice videos of fluent and non-fluent readers in different countries. And even if you don't know the language they're reading, it can be quite apparent who is the fluent and who is the not fluent reader. Another question about how can you introduce listening and reading comprehension progressively through the early grades, one to three? How do you introduce it progressively? Well, um, 
you want to begin oral language and uh, listening comprehension activities like from day one as soon as the children get to school, right? You're, you're wanting to engage them in read aloud activities and talking about those stories and talking about those texts because what you're doing there is you're building the foundation for when they start applying that to text. Usually in grade one and, and often in grade two, children are still learning how to read, right? They're learning how to sound out the letters. They're learning what, what are those letter sounds? How do I take these individual letters and the sounds that they represent and blend them to form words and then link words together to say phrases, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, end of grade one text might be the cat, the fat cat cat, the fat cat sat on the mat. Now there's not a lot of comprehension activity that you can do with that, right? So in the very beginning, as you're really building those decoding skills, you're in the meantime, you're building their oral language vocabulary and then you're building those listening comprehension skills and you're talking about stories, you're retelling stories, you're finding the details in stories with oral language, right? During this, doing this orally with listening comprehension. You're exposing the children to some informational or expository text and talking about the characteristics of whatever that text is about. Um, and you're doing that orally for the first year or so only because they're not ready to apply those skills to text because they can't read the text yet. But as soon as they get to the point where they're reading connected text, then we need to start trying to encourage them to apply some of those skills. So even if they have a very short, you know, four or five line, four or five sentence story that they've now learned to read because that's a decodable text for them, you can start asking them, well, who are the characters in that story and what were they doing? And, you know, what was their goal and how did they get what happened in the story? And then, even what happened in the beginning and then what happened and then what happened in the end. So beginning, middle, end. Working through all of that, as long as you're doing it orally and building a strong foundation in their oral language skills, they should be able to apply it when they begin reading with support from the teacher. He says, I, I noted that some struggling readers tend to focus too much on non-content words like the, and, this, and him. And this interferes with fluency. Could you comment? Absolutely. So if you see children that are struggling and they're really focusing on those tiny little words, then they should be um, doing activities that are going to build those, like basically turning those words into sight words for them, getting flashcards and having them practice them, reading lists of words and having them practice reading that list faster and faster. Because that means that the child is focusing on decoding that word and they're not automatic for them. So they need to make those words automatic and they need to practice, practice, practice and get lots and lots of experience with the little words so that when they're reading connected text, those little words are a breeze to read. And we had a question about reading assessment tools and reading. what kinds of tools um, could, should, could be used. Okay. Um, it does depend on uh, the, the, the grade level of the child and, the, and what types of instruction the child has been exposed to. And I'm not going to go really heavily into assessment because Dr. Young Suk Grace Kim is going to talk more about assessment. But um, you, wanna, you want to assess in the early grades their oral reading fluency, um, looking at either lists or more preferably connected text reading that's decodable and on their grade level. Using decodable text, meaning you're, you're using words that they've already been exposed to, they've already been instructed in to create sentences or stories and then timing them on reading those, identifying the words that they're not able to read correctly, and then providing instruction on those words that they're not able to decode. And then you can also look at like fluency rubrics. Do they, you know, how many words per minute, how many errors, and then if they can read fluently and they can read all of those words, are they reading it in a way that sounds like they're talking so it sounds like language rather than sounds like them just choppily reading a, a sentence. Um, but like I said, I'm not going to go much. I, I'm going to touch on, I'm going to touch on some assessment later, but I'm not going to go really heavy into it because I'm going to allow Dr. Kim to really talk about that. Thank you. I also just wanted to mention, as many people on the phone may know or on the line may know, the early grade reading assessment 
but that's for a different purpose outside of classroom classroom based assessment, but that's been adapted as more of a program assessment and evaluation tool. But our website does have a number of those assessments that can be adapted and a toolkit for how to do so. Um, Adrian, maybe we'll just take one more question before moving on in relation to writing. At what stage can we introduce writing to learners? As soon as the children learn the letters. As soon as the children learn letters, they learn letter sound correlations. If they're reading the letters and you're teaching them how to read words, then they should be writing those words also. And it's okay, emergent, emergent readers and writers do not spell correctly. Um, if they spell I love pizza with I L V P Z A, that's beautiful because that's showing you what they know and what they're ready to learn, right? But the important part is as soon as they're able to start making those letter sound connections, we want to see them writing and writing their own thoughts and ideas, not just copying text or copying sentences. But I would say grade one, get them writing in grade one, because the sooner they begin, the more skilled they're going to become and the more quickly they're going to become skilled. And, and I also want to comment on the comprehension. Um, some people have said to me, you know, it's not until grade three that we can ask higher level comprehension skills, which really isn't true. Because even grade one children, if you say, hey, let's read this story and you know, who are the characters and what was the setting and all of this, but then say, all right, well, how would you feel if you were that character? Or do you think that that character made the right choice and why? Those are higher level comprehension skills. And we can start asking very young children to start thinking about those things and to start co comprehending those texts on a deeper level more than just identifying the parts of the story that answer low level questions. Okay, and I've seen several people have actually begun responding to the activity, right? How have you seen instruction adapted to the following uh, situations and what would you suggest? The last one that I saw come in was um, low resource and conflict settings. We found that giving the teachers appropriate lesson structures and a knowledge of how to produce materials with local resources, very important. They can turn their classrooms into safe spaces where kids are willing to attend and participate, which takes away the, from the focus of conflict or poverty and helps the teacher realize the power of effective reading instruction. Absolutely, empowering the teachers in both conflict areas, conflict settings and low resource settings, showing teachers how they can create um, materials for their classroom using low cost or no cost materials in their environment. Um, large classroom settings, we often think that with large classrooms um, that there's no possibility for effective instruction. But it really lends itself to allowing us to have time for more group work, um, more collaboration. It also means that the teacher needs to have good classroom management skills and know how to manage the classroom to keep the kids um, with routines that the children know what to expect that they can collaborate and they know how to come back to a whole group setting. Multi-age or multi-grade classrooms really offer opportunities for peer learning where we have student-centered participatory teaching and learning where you have maybe paired up a lower level learner and a higher level learner where they're learning from each other because even when this, the higher level learner is helping the lower level learner, they are still learning themselves. And then in the next pair, maybe they're paired with someone that's higher than them. Grouping children in low resource um, settings, right? Um, avoiding conflict. And I think, you know, part of this does go into teaching children to collaborate and teaching them how to learn from each other. And that, you know, working in a group doesn't mean cheating. Right? It means that you're working together collaboratively, and that's a very, I feel, important, um, important concept to teach, that working together collaboratively is not cheating, but it's, it's learning from one another. Um, all right, so um, I think we're going to wrap up on this, and I want to take a quick few moments for you to return to that KWL that we started at the beginning. You wrote some things under K, what you already knew about early grade literacy. You wrote some things that you wanted to learn about early grade literacy. And now I'd like you to reflect back and write some things that you learned about these skills, how, that they're, how they're taught, 
um, what teachers need to know, what children need to experience, something along those lines. Um, the first question is, if words that are decodable are taught as sight words, then is it going back to logo, logo, logography, um, the logographic stage, right? Ideally, we don't want to teach decodable words as sight words, right? We want to teach children to decode those words. But there may be occasionally a word in a text, particularly, and if you're using decodable text in the classroom, this isn't going to be an issue. But if you're using something that's not a decodable text for the children to read, it may be an issue that there's going to be a word that they just don't know how to decode yet. Well, when they learn that skill, you go back and make sure that they know how to decode that word. You don't teach it as a sight word and then just never address it again because that skill is going, it should come up in the curriculum, that, that spelling pattern should come up in the curriculum at some point. Um, and then later as the words get bigger and the children get older, we learn to teach, we teach them like an analogy where they just recognize the spelling pattern and then that spelling pattern, you know, they can, uh, they can apply that spelling pattern to other words that have the same spelling pattern. So it's not really going back to the logographic stage. If you taught just the words, all words as sight words, you'd be teaching whole language, meaning you're not teaching how to decode. Um, but ideally we want to teach children the skills of recognizing the individual sounds and then applying those letters to the sounds or recognizing the letter and then the sound that goes with that letter and blending those sounds together. Um, so I hope that kind of addresses that question. The next one is, how do we know how many such sight words should be in a decodable reader? Is there a standard? I don't know off the top of my head what the standard is, but I know that it's very limited. Um, when you're reading, there might be in a short text for, you know, a grade one, end of grade one, I want to say there might be five sight words in the, the story. Um, and like I say, I, this is kind of what I'm thinking about looking at decodable readers that I've worked with in the past that maybe at the end of the book, there's a list of about five sight words that are sight words for that story. You really want to limit it. You don't want them being exposed to a lot of sight words because the purpose of the text is for them to be decoding text. So most of those story, most of the words in that story need to be decodable and on their level. What is the essence of teaching nonsense words as part of helping kids learn to read? So <clears throat> there are some mixed ideas about this in the field, but Nonsense words are not for learning how to read. Nonsense words are for assessing a child's ability to decode a word that he does not know. So if a child, the idea behind this is if a child knows the spelling patterns, the phonics patterns, knows how to decode and can come across an unknown word, some novel word, and apply those decoding skills, those spelling pattern knowledge skills, right? to that word, then they can decode that word. So on assessments, you want to provide words that you know that that child doesn't know because you want to see how well they can apply their phonics skills. That's not, that, those types of activities were not designed for instruction. So when I see non-word, nonsense word instruction as part of curriculums, it kind of makes my heart hurt because that's a waste of time in my, in my perspective. I am not representing the whole research community. I am telling you my personal opinion that I don't feel that teaching nonsense words in a curriculum is an appropriate use of time when you can be using that time to teach children how to decode a more complex spelling pattern. Nonsense words are for assessing the child's ability to apply phonics skills, and that is it. Um, and the last question is um, how teachers can use pictures in the text to help children learn how to comprehend. Um, okay, so pictures are important, particularly for young kids, right, because pictures help them create that visual image of what's happening in the story. It's very important that the teacher is very clear with the children that the story is not in the pictures, the story is in the words. But we can look at the picture and say, well, what's going on in this picture? What's happening in the picture? And then let's read the text and see 
what does the text tell us about the picture that we weren't able to get from the picture? Or how does understanding the text help us understand what's going on in the picture, right? Or maybe that picture helps me, gives me a better idea of what that character looks like because maybe the text doesn't really clearly describe him or her. But um, we want to, particularly with the young ones, right, as they're transitioning and they're starting to learn the difference between text and pictures, and they're still relying on a lot of visual cues for, you know, what's happening in the story, pictures are good. Um, but we really want to be clear about the information, the, the story is in the words, it's not in the pictures. Now, not to say that picture books aren't good for older kids, because who doesn't love a picture book story? I love picture book stories, and every child I ever taught, or class I ever showed, or workshop I ever did a read aloud in, everyone loves the picture books. So they are engaging, and they are intriguing, and so the using picture books might motivate children. So if you have a child who just doesn't want to read, a picture book might motivate them to, to be more involved or to get more involved in the text or might interest them more in reading. But we really do need to focus on the text. I'm going to very briefly talk about orthography. Um, orthography can be transparent, meaning that one letter represents one sound and one sound is only spelled one way. Or they can be very um, opaque or, or dense, right? In English, the letters O-U-G-H can be pronounced as O in the word through, O in the word though, and UF in the word rough, which means that English has a very opaque orthography. It's difficult to, for, for children to learn all of the different spelling patterns for one sound or that one spelling pattern can be pronounced many different ways. So English is one of the languages that's very unique in its need for sight words. Um, so like I was, we were talking earlier about why would you introduce sight words into early grade reading? Well, because in, in the English language, sometimes we need to use words that the kids just don't know how to read yet. But in a lot of the African languages, um, particularly, I know, I know, more about the African language and some of the, uh, in, in Spanish, it's more, more transparent. But in a lot of the African languages, the orthographies are very transparent. So one letter always makes one sound, and that sound is always spelled a specific way. So in African languages, you're going to have less of a need to teach sight words and more of a need to focus on decoding skills. Because you know, sight words might not even be really a big issue in some of those languages, you know, depending upon the level of, like, what the orthography is like. We're going to talk about some of the characteristics of effective instruction. Now, for this section, I am not going to go really heavily in detail because um, Dr. Kim, Dr. Young, Grace Kim, is going to come in at the end and talk about some of the white papers she's written on these specific topics. But... When we look at explicit instruction, expl or, excuse me, when we look at effective instruction, effective instruction is systematic, it's explicit, it's structured, it's informed by assessment outcomes, it's allocated for in the daily school timetable and well managed in the classroom, and it addresses the needs of all learners. So when we talk about systematic instruction, we mean that Lessons are sequenced in a developmental progression. So children develop skills, cognitive, cognitively develop in a very predictable way that research has shown, right? So we sequence our lessons in a logical and developmental progression. We teach phonemic awareness before, like we get that phonological awareness at the, maybe we teach um, syllables before we go into phonemic awareness because syllables is easier than individual sounds. So a scope and sequence is something that um, every curricular plan should have. It, the scope is the breadth. All of the content that should be taught either at the specific grade level or you know, across the grade levels. And the sequence is the order in which those skills and content should be taught for best learning. And we're talking about the scope and sequence both within a grade level and across grade levels. 
And at the grade level, it's broken down typically by week. What skills are taught each week? What order are they, what, in what order? What specific letters in grade one, what specific letters are going to be taught that week? What listening and listening comprehension activities are going to be built into the curriculum that week? What spelling activities are going to be done? What vocabulary words are going to be introduced and taught that week? And, and having this type of systematic instruction really supports teachers because if they know exactly what they're teaching that week, they're able to provide more effective instruction. When we have systematic instruction, the children are not asked to do something that's developmentally too difficult for them because the curriculum has been organized in a developmental progression and the skills slowly get, become more difficult as the year, as the weeks pass and the year progresses. Explicit instruction. When I was talking about the vocabulary instruction earlier, that's explicit instruction. The word is automobile. Automobile is a, a mode of transportation that takes, um, takes us from one place to another. When we use explicit instruction, we tell the students directly what they're learning. We model the skills, we model the strategies. We don't say, oh, well, what do you think this word means? And they might not know. They are gonna be guessing and those guesses are the ones that they're going to be remembering. So we wanna provide very explicit instruction. We don't want them to guess. We want them to know exactly what's expected of them and, and model for them if we're using a skill like Segmenting phonemes, think back to that video, right? She pulled the first toy out. She told them what it was. It was a log. She segmented it, log. They counted it. She put it in the basket. She showed them exactly what she wanted them to do before she asked the children to do it. And this is called the gradual release model, where the teacher initially models the skill. Full support shows the children exactly what to do called the I do, right? And then as you move into allowing the children to start practicing, it's we do. The teacher was working with the students, they, the lion, she counted it off with them, they decided together what basket it went into. If she had seen them make errors, she would have immediately modeled again to show them exactly what she expected. The majority of instructional time should be spent in the we do phase because children need to be guided through applying these strategies, applying these skills. Even if they're doing those phonics pages we saw earlier, the teacher is circulating, helping them figure out what letter goes into that box. How do you know? What is the sound? What is the picture? And then once children can do those skills on their own independently, you move into the you do. And the you do is typically for monitoring their use of the skills, assessing their ability to apply the skills to novel situations, and assessing their learning. When teachers have daily lesson plans that provide learning outcomes, structured activities, and guided instructions, they are more effective. So structured instruction helps teachers and students know what to expect each day. Most lesson plans are similar across the day. So both the teachers and the students have a routine. They know what to expect. That way they're ready for it. And when children are ready for learning, they learn more. Now for, for different projects, right? Lesson plans should be field tested um, because they can be highly scripted where the teacher literally has to read from the teacher's guide. This is exactly what I'm saying or they could be less scripted where the teacher's guide just tells the teacher what to talk about or what to teach about. Now, when you have less scripted teacher's guides, that means the teachers really need to know their business. They need to know what they're teaching. They need to have been trained on that content. They need to be ready to deliver it to the children without hesitation. So sometimes in projects you'll see at the beginning, you start with very scripted lesson plans and lots of teacher training, and then toward the end, the, scripted, the lesson plans are less scripted because the teachers have the skills to be able to, in essence, wing it and, and do the, provide the instruction that their children need and vary from a script.
Now, I know that a lot of times teachers will say, well, I don't want to work from a script because I know what I know and that doesn't give me any creativity. And that's fine as long as they know how to instruct the skill that they're supposed to be instructing. So that's, there's a lot of discussion in the field right now about what is the appropriate level of scripting. And honestly, there's no right answer because the right answer is going to be what your teachers need and what your students need, what your project needs. It's going to be different for every project. So in this picture on the left, you see the teacher has her hand in the air and the children have their hand in the air. That teacher is actually assessing the student's skills. She's assessing their ability to write whatever letter or, or whatever she's having them write, right? She's watching them do it in the air. Because if they can do it in the air, then they can probably do it in their book, right? But she needs to know, really quick way, which of these kids are understanding the lesson and can apply this skill, and which of these students need additional instruction. So by quickly assessing, she can identify which children and which skills need to be reviewed. She's monitoring their student progress, and she's using that information to guide her instruction. Because if all of the children get it wrong, she's going to go back to modeling, right? They're in the we do slash you do phase where she's doing it with them. She's assessing. And the, the, the gradual release model is a continuum, just like assessment is a continuum. There's, there's a lot of gray area. There's no black and white. But she's also demonstrating, like, so she, her assessment of them is also demonstrating the effectiveness of her instruction. Because if those children are not able to do whatever it is that she's asking them to do, she can identify within herself and hopefully reflect and say, whatever instruction I just gave was not the right instruction for these children. I need to do something different and I need to improve or change my instruction. Or if most of the children are able to do it and some of the children fail, she can say to herself, okay, the, this group of children needs additional instruction in this skill. That's called formative assessment because you're still forming the instruction. You're still forming the knowledge in the children's minds. In their, it, you're still forming the learning. We're evaluating on the fly. We're evaluating as we go. We do this naturally all the time. If you're in a face-to-face -face workshop, you're evaluating whether people are paying attention to you or if they're trying to fall asleep and that's telling you you might need to take a break, right? So as we're with our children in the classroom or as teachers are with their children, they are constantly assessing or they should be formatively assessing and using that information to impact instruction. If they assess, and then they don't do anything with that information and just write a grade, then that's summative assessment, right? Because it's not, it's not informing um, instruction. And I love, I love, love, love this quote at the bottom. When the cook tastes the soup, that's formative. When the guests taste the soup, that's summative. Because you can't change it after that. It's done. You're not doing anything else with it. The instruction has taken place. We want our teachers to be well-informed and well-skilled in formative assessment. So time allocation. Allocated time refers to the amount of time that the school or the government or the headmaster or the head teacher says, this is the amount of time that you will have for teaching this year. But there's a lot of things that take place, right? Teachers have to go get paid. Sometimes they go to the market. Sometimes they come in late. Sometimes children come in late. That limits the instructional time that's actually available for learning. And then of that instructional time, if the children are busy looking out the window, then they're not engaged. So we need to look at, as we look at time allocation in programs, what is the allocated time, what is the instructional time, and what is the engaged time? In developing countries, the gold standard is 1,000 hours of instructional time per academic year in all subjects. This is five and a half hours per day, five days a week. Now, in developing countries, children rarely attend school five days a week. And even when they do, they rarely get five and a half hours of instruction. So, what does that look like, right? We really have to pay attention to the time on task. A child might not be actively engaged, and so teachers have to be skilled in the content, they have to be skilled with their pedagogical approaches, 
They have to know how to manage their classroom, their resources, and their time. Focusing on the we do and you do parts of the lesson plan because children learn more when they're doing. Well, all of us, we all learn more when we're doing, right? And so this is a time on task study from Sokoto and Bauchi State. The allocated time is 630 hours per year for instruction in all subjects. On the left hand side, you see all the different things that take time away. So there's resumption, the teachers are absent, there are market days, there's public holidays, teachers are tardy, professional development, visit to their local government, education authorities, teacher verification, they have to leave and in these two states, they take one day per month to go get their salary. Out of 630 allocated hours, that leaves 239 hours per year for instruction in all subjects. That doesn't include, that doesn't really address, this graphic does not tell you how much time is allocated to reading, or within that, how much time children actually have hands and eyes on text. So this is something to think about. If uh, the gold standard is 1,000 hours, and all of this brings it down to 239 instructional hours, it's, um, we have to question whether those children will actually make the gains that we anticipate them making. We have to consider, now, this is actually really important to think about when you're planning a program, right? If you're going in and you're developing a program, you want to look at this kind of stuff because you have to look at the timetable and decide how should the scope and sequence be designed? How often can reading be taught? Is it, can it be taught daily or maybe it can only be taught a few times a week? How can reading instruction be separated from language instruction, which is a really important separation? Should lessons be repeated, right? Should, if, if there's a high level of teacher or student absence, should every fifth day be a review and reteach day? Or should review weeks be included? How often should that happen? And there's no like set in stone answer because it's going to depend on the context and the amount of instructional time that's available to each teacher. We also have to train our teachers on providing inclusive education or instruction that supports access and equity for all, right? They have to identify the student needs and adapt instruction. Um, they have to identify those target reading skill weaknesses and provide explicit instruction to children with disabilities. Oftentimes, they just need more explicit instruction, additional explicit instruction, more time, more instruction, more repetition. We want to make sure that teachers are using gender equitable practices, right? Uh, even if the genders have to be separated with boys on one side and girls on the other, maybe you want to make sure they're on left and right and not boys in the front and girls in the back. And if they're separated, then the teacher can walk between the groups and, and do the teaching and make sure that they're reaching all of those learners and addressing the needs of all of those learners. And oftentimes, particularly in conflict areas, we have to address socio-emotional learning needs. Um, we, we have to address trauma. We have to address security issues, like emotional security issues. Um, this is a resource design uh, published by um, uh, REACH. It's Universal Design for Learning to Help All Children Read. Um, and that will be with some others that you'll be receiving a list of references and resources that's quite extensive resources on on everything that you've seen along with some technology and um, assessment the the reference list is quite extensive so technology right technology instruction we want to integrate technology videos there are mobile apps that can provide targeted instructional support on phonological and phonemic awareness, or doing hearing and vision screenings. Um, the tangerine class for, um, in Kenya was used to uh, track student progress. There, there are several mobile learning apps. We have a lot of information about this, but like I said, I'm not going to go really far into all of these topics right now. But you can use ICT support to make sure that you're providing instruction for all children. So in Ethiopia, um, the teachers received like inclusive multimedia lesson plans where they received specific guidance on 
how to um, include children with certain disabilities, right? How, how do I address that disability? And th that was included in the materials that they received. They had audio files for the phonemic awareness so that um, the child could like press or the teacher could push on the fidel and then the sound of the fidel would play. So um, we, can, we can use that instructional support to um, help, help meet the needs of all, all of our children. Hi, Adrian. This is Allison. We had one question earlier um, that we've also had a bit of a conversation about online, but others may be interested in hearing a bit more from you about how do we know whether the content uh, of a reading curriculum is appropriate for different grades? Um, and this might apply across different languages. How do you know if the content is appropriate for different grades? Okay. So you're a reading program setting out to develop the content perhaps in a language that reading hasn't really been taught, or maybe it has, but it hasn't necessarily been effective. How do you identify that appropriate content for the different grades? Okay, so you definitely want to begin at the beginning, right? Um, I, I would suggest going and looking at, so if you want to start at first grade, you have to know what are the most frequent sounds in the language, what are the most frequent letters used in the language, and those are the first ones that you start teaching. Because when they learn the most frequent, then they can start writing the most frequent words and they start reading and writing faster. Um, you have to look at the developmental progression. Um, teaching more than two letters or symbols per week is probably going to be too much for five and six-year-olds. Um, so you have to look at how long is it going to take. If you have 13 letters in the language, well, that's going to take, you know, about, what, six or eight weeks. They're going to know all the letters and sounds and start, start reading. But if there's 256 fidels, it's going to take two years for them to have all of those fidels. So I think really making sure that you're looking at what can the child developmentally, you know, what is the child developmentally ready to process and, and what's their cognitive load. Um, content, a lot of times the, the themes around the weeks are, begin with familiar themes, family, community, learning, the classroom, um, and develop into more advanced themes. I mean, um, and so I, hmm, when you look across languages, I think that's, that's the key there is, is how do you make sure that it's appropriate across languages? And it depends on the two languages or the five languages or whatever languages, because you might not have the same type of scope and sequence, right? Because like I said, in one language, by the end of first grade, they might know all the letter sounds and be able to decode words. And if it's a transparent orthography, start reading really, really quickly. But if there's many more letters or a much more opaque orthography, it's going to take longer for them to start developing into those more complex reading, be ready for those more complex reading skills. So I hate to just give a general question, but I think without really looking at the specific characteristics of the language, it's difficult to know, you know, what is going to be appropriate. How do you know if it's appropriate? Look at the curriculum and say, can a six-year-old do this? Realistically, can a six-year-old do this? And am I aligning the curriculum and building their knowledge in a way that helps them? And each time I introduce something new, they already know like 80% of it. They've already, they've already learned like 80% of the knowledge that now they're being expected to perform on, 90% maybe. Like, so we have to really address, are, are the children ready for that next developmental step? And if I just might add um, for that, that question, there's certainly a lot of planning in terms of how much instructional time is available, um, what the teachers are able to teach, and uh, certainly we look at um, what the kids are learning as they go through assessment to see if the content is appropriate, as Adrian mentioned. And in the chat, there were a few other, uh, in the Q&A box, there were a few other considerations, certainly early grade reading programs pilot the content they develop and then they evaluate to see if the content was indeed appropriate or if it needs to be adjusted. So there is some trial and error, especially in places where certain languages haven't been used for reading instruction. Right, it is, it is often a moving target, right? You have to kind of develop something, get it out there, pilot it, see how the performance is. And then you might find that over time, oh, we can make this more difficult or it's too difficult in the beginning, we gotta back way off. 
um, ass assessment and using that assessment to inform design is going to be really important, like Allison said. And I, I want to address this question. Uh, Samantha said the topic of scripting. You know, this is about scaling up. Um, the rule of thumb, she said the rule of thumb will be as little scripting as possible. Ideally, that would be ideal, right? The cheaper alternative would be to just print a bunch of scripts rather than training your teachers. Um, in the beginning, the teachers might not know what to do, so they might need that scripting. But ideally, yeah, we want to back off. We want to give them the flexibility to teach the way that they know how to teach. But the key to that is that they know how to teach it. Yes, content standards as a basis for developing the scope and sequence. Absolutely, right? Do you want to say at the end of first grade, the children should be able to do X, Y, and Z? At the end of second grade, the children should know and be able to do all of this. Um, but we have to make sure that those content standards and uh, those benchmarks, if it, as you were, uh, it, that they're appropriate for the developmental le level of the child and of the children. So for those who may have joined us a little bit late, I read um, Dr. Kim's biography at the beginning, but I'll just um, recap here. Dr. Kim is a professor <clears throat> at the University of California, Irvine. She was previously at the Florida Center for Reading Research at Florida State University, and she has supported REACH and the Global Reading Network pre previously as one of the authors of the Landscape Report on Early Grade Literacy Skills, which is a very, very useful resource um, to learn more about what we've been talking about today, as well as some other topics in early grade reading. It's a very useful summary of, of the skills and effective instructional approaches, and we invite you to find that on our website. Uh, a direct link to it will also be provided at the end of this presentation and in the references and resources that you will receive after the webinar. So if Dr. Kim is ready to go, we will move on to her presentation. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Young Sukhrais Kim. I usually go by Young. And um, I'm at the University of California, Irvine. And um, today, uh, first of all, I'm very, very um, um, happy to meet you all. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, two things um, together, integrated together, structured pedagogy and formative assessment. And the content of these topics is based on our recent white papers um, that, were, that were developed uh, in collaboration with Marsha Davison through um, REACH. I also want to note that for the white paper on formative assessment, Mark and Hethel also were contributing authors. Um, so, um, drawing from a large body of empirical studies in cognitive, developmental, and education science, we're going to talk about the following evidence-based pedagogical principles or features of um, structured pedagogy. Um, the first one is explicit and systematic instruction. I understand that Adrian actually has touched upon a few of these. Um, the second one is maximizing instructional time. The third one is, the fourth one is scaffolding. Fifth one is assessment informed instructional decisions. And the last one is a social emotional engagement for learning. So uh, I'm going to spend time talking about each of these points. And then we're going to clarify um, some misconceptions about structured pedagogy. So Adrian has spent some time on a few of these. Um, there's some um, overlap, then I'm not going to spend too much time on the kind of, I'm not going to repeat the same thing. And I'm going to, I may move on a few points somewhat quickly. So this structured, direct, and clearly express methodology of teaching of target skills. And uh, systematic, as we know, right, is um, it refers to orderly and planned step-by-step -step sequence of instruction, right? So that includes, um, you know, systematic schedule and scope and sequence, also a systematic set of activities and materials. And explicit and systematic instruction applies to both um, curriculum and instructional units within a curriculum. So when it comes to curriculum, I guess this, this figure uh, illustrates curriculum, 
in reading in multiple elements that we, Adrian has gone over already, right? Such as blood awareness, phonics, reading fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Comprehension including both listening comprehension and reading comprehension. Um, explicit system and systematic approach in initial reading curriculum, for example, uh, focuses on emergent literacy skills such as philosophical awareness and letter knowledge. And this is followed by phonics, which progresses from sh using short, simple words to longer, multi-syllabic words, and from simple patterns to complex patterns, right? So this is a systematic, right? When it comes to uh, instructional sequence with theme, also explicit and systematic, right? So for example, when teaching philosophical awareness, one would uh, proceed from larger phonological unit, say like, you know, syllables, to a smaller unit, phoneme, and from easier tasks such as, you know, recognizing sound, right? That's easier than more challenging tasks such as manipulating, deleting sound, or substituting sounds, right? So explicit and systematic instruction applies to both curriculum and each individual lesson and units. So learning requires time, right? And um, actually, Adrian touched upon this. Um, there are different aspects of time that should be distinguished. Allocated time, um, that's uh, the actual amount of time allocated for literacy. The actual instructional time, that's the amount of time actually spent on instruction and actual engagement time, that is the time that students are engaged in learning. So as we know, allocated time is absolutely necessary, right? It has to be secured. But this is typically determined uh, uh, by government and typically teachers don't have a lot of uh, control over it. What um, teachers have control over is actual instructional time, which should be maximized for effective instruction. Um, studies have shown that there's a large variation across classrooms in how teachers spend and uh, manage their time in the classroom. So some classrooms waste a lot of instructional time on non-academic tasks, such as you know, explaining things, what, like explaining and finding where things are or where to find, uh, place things, right, when things are completed. And sometimes, you know, transition times between activities. Um, now, some teachers actually um, were more organized in their classroom procedures and spend greater time on establishing classroom routines uh, early in the year. And students in those classrooms where teachers are more organized actually learned more during the year and they had higher achievement in reading skills at the end of the year compared to um, students who were in the classroom where instruction was less organized and routines were not uh, established early in the year. So the third feature, um, the next feature um, is um, of structured pedagogy is evidence-based instructional routines that include reviewing previous learning, um, presenting new material, providing models, providing opportunities, providing corrective feedback, and conducting regular reviews. First, Review of previous learning. We as human beings learn better when new materials are connected to what we already know about the subject. So review can include additional practice on facts and skills from pre previous learning sessions and going over homework together or correcting errors together. When um, presenting new materials, uh, it is important to carefully consider the amount of information presented to students. Um, you know, learning new material or new information involves memory capacity, such as working memory. And, the mem and memory capacity is, working memory specifically, can handle only a small amount of information at one time. So if we uh, provide too much information at once, it will overload the processing capacity and overwhelm students. 
So effective teachers uh, present information in the right chunk and at the right difficulty level, considering students' developmental phase and learning pace. Some students learn quickly than other students, so we have to consider that as well. Next, provide models. Uh, lots of, uh, a lot of academic content is typically abstract concepts, right, and involves multiple um, steps. Um, therefore, it is important to demonstrate how things are done to facilitate students' understanding. And uh, modeling would include step-by-step -step process of problem solving or think aloud. So think aloud is uh, verbally expressing teachers' own thinking process, right? So one example in reading comprehension or listening comprehension, for example, when using think aloud is, say a teacher reads the following sentences. It's, it was hot and humid, bugs were buzzing around. How annoying, he thought. Then the teacher can verbalize her thinking process in inferring that, well, the season seems to be summer. Uh, even though the information is not really explicitly stated, you can actually infer information from the text that the teacher read. And the teacher can express it, so the teach, uh, students can hear it. Um, provide opportunities for our practice. For students to learn content, practice with the materials um, is necessary. And this includes experiencing the materials multiple times uh, through rehearsal, through working through, elaborating new materials before they are forgotten. So teachers, multiple opportunities for students to engage in um, process, step processes, right? So the first one is guided practice. Um, the next one is independent practice. So guided practice is widely known as we do. Independent practice is widely known as you do. Um, in guided practice, after the teacher pre presents new material with modeling, um, she presents a similar task where the student is given an opportunity to work on with all the new material, while the teacher provides additional explanations and examples. Independent practice is where the teacher reduces the support and let the student work independently through the problem using the processes and strategies learned through um, teacher, the previous processes, teacher modeling and uh, guided practice. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize here about the independent practice is that it should involve a material that is the same or with a slight variation as guided practice not a completely different learning materials, right? So that students can complete task, uh, the task independently. <clears throat> Provide corrective feedback. Effective teachers frequently check for student understanding of the new material and provide feedback. And checking can be done in various ways and include asking questions, asking for elaboration or summarizing um, new content. Feedback that improves students' learning um, provides cues uh, specific to learning goals. And praise for task performance itself does not, studies have found that it doesn't really improve learning. It has to be specific on the, the task performance and the process itself. And finally, uh, for the uh, instructional routines, conduct regular reviews. Providing opportunities for practice on a regular basis helps reduce forgetting and facilitates learning, right? So for example, uh, we can empl employ um, unit review or weekly review or monthly review, and this will uh, facilitate students' learning by you know, providing review and the rehearsal and in uh, opportunities for integrating new uh, materials. And the fourth principle is scaffolding. So scaffolding, uh, I mean, in instruction, when we talk about scaffolding and in instruction, it uh, refers to providing support, structure, and guidance during instruction. And just like a physical scaffolding structure used in construction, scaffolding provides support to complete a task that could not be done otherwise. And you know, the principles that we have talked about here, such as explicit um, in systematic instruction and instructional routines, these are all means of providing scaffolding. So you know, this is again, this, Adrian has actually gone over this. 
So again, this is kind of, you know, graphic representation of scaffolding, the idea of scaffolding, right? Through teacher modeling, guided practice, uh, independent practice, and review. As you can see, initially, the teacher is providing a lot of hand-holding. You can see on the left side, right? And then, and later on, the student is actually working independently, and therefore, amount of um, teacher support is reduced gradually over time. And um, scaffolding is particularly important for complex tests, you know, that tasks that involve multiple steps. Um, it is also very important, particularly important for students uh, with the learning difficulties, right? So students who have difficulty with, you know, controlling their attention or self-regulation, or, you know, students who are just in general struggling. They just need a much more explicit scaffolding strategies. The fifth principle is assessment-informed instruction. Um, you know, if you step in the classroom and spend about you know, 10 minutes, you'll immediately recognize that there are large differences among children in their learning needs. Some children may already be proficient in the target skill, whereas other students uh, you know, have little knowledge right, on the target skill. Some children learn new materials at a very quick pace, well, while others need much more support and you know, repetition and support and practice. So, Uniform or one-size-fits-all instruction targeting average students in the class would not uh, meet the needs of all students. So to meet the varying uh, learning needs of students and to teach children at the right level, the very first snap, step of um, effect, effective instruction is gathering information about students' skills in the target area, that is assessment. So assessment that is aligned, uh, designed to um, inform instructional decisions, so called formative assessments, right? There are many different types of assessments, but the assessment that is relevant for instruction to make instructional decisions are called formative assessments, and that is gathering information about students' performance for the purpose of improving teaching or learning. So it is assessment for learning, not of learning. There are um, four types of complementary formative assessment, um, screening, progress monitoring, benchmark, and master learning. Screening assessment is to develop an initial big picture uh, about the student's level on key skills. You know, so for example, alphabet knowledge or you know, phonological awareness. And uh, we do this to identify students who may need further detailed follow-up assessments called diagnostic assessments, right? So screening assessment um, uh, typically includes a brief assessment of key skills at the beginning of school year for all students. Progress monitoring assessment is conducted to closely keep track of uh, progress in key skills for students who have not goals to see whether students are catching up or falling behind or whether they'll, be, they'll need more support. Um, so progress monitoring data are gathered at a relatively frequent um, intervals, like it could be weekly, bi-weekly, or every four weeks, depending on the target skills. Benchmark assessment is, um, think about the word benchmark, right? So it's to gauge students' performance, uh, whether students' performance meets the expected target level, which is benchmark, at a certain critical agreed upon per time period. So a benchmark, you know, could be, for example, how many alphabet letters should students know by the middle of uh, year one? to ensure their successful reading development, or you know, how much of logical awareness should students you know, um, achieve by you know, say, the first three months, right? Um, benchmark should not be mistaken as the end of your goal only. Um, instead, it can be at any agreed upon critical time points during the year, it can be at a trimester or quarterly or by annual interval. 
Finally, um, monitoring of students' mastery learning is conducted to measure students' learning of content taught that day. Mastery learning helps teachers track students' uh, progress on a daily basis and uh, gives an uh, opportunity to provide feedback and reteach if necessary in the moment. And mastery learning assessment can include observation, teacher's observation of students, questioning, exercises, and quizzes used in the classroom. So this figure illustrates the process of formative assessment that I just described. So based on the information gathered from um, screening, decisions are made about the strengths and weaknesses of students and um, their instructional grouping, right? So um, some students have, who are weak in the target skill, you put them together, and those students who are strong in the target skill, you put them together. And then students are provided with a differentiated instruction based on their learning needs. And progress monitoring is conducted for those who need uh, uh, continued attention. This is followed by benchmark assessment and continues with a differentiated instruction, progress monitoring throughout the year. So this is, uh, you know, uh, it goes throughout um, the year. And along um, the way, um, uh, daily monitoring of uh, mastery learning is employed. So then the question is, right, what skills do we assess? Research in the last about four or five decades has clearly identified key skills of instruction and assessments. And these, these are all the pieces that uh, Adrian has already covered. So this, is, this table is a summary of it, right? So, um, Emergent skills such as logical awareness and orthographic knowledge, um, you know, such as uh, letter knowledge, as well as word reading, are typically assessed in year one. And uh, other higher order skills such as text reading fluency, reading comprehension, are assessed somewhat later. Or language skills, uh, which are really critical for essential uh, uh, reading comprehension, should be taught and assessed throughout, from beginning to the end, right? And um, in the last decades, uh, many formative assessment tools have been developed and they have been used in developing countries. And I want to talk about a couple of, to, uh, a couple of things. Uh, I want to bring a couple of things to attention uh, regarding these. The first one is that simply, um, you know, administering these assessments more frequently is not formative assessment, right? Formative assessment by definition, as we discussed, is it, it, it's actually for the purpose of informing instruction. So not just administering these assessments more frequently, but you have to use these assessment data to inform your instruction or making instructional decisions. And uh, uh, this link actually shows lots of, um, you know, uh, uh, assessment um, uh, videos as well as instructional, effective instruction. Last, but certainly not least, the last principle is the uh, social emotional engagement for learning. The best learning occurs when students are socially and emotionally engaged in learning in the context of uh, supportive relationships. No matter how explicit and systematic instruction is, learning does not occur if the student is not cognitively and emotionally engaged. Um, studies have shown that learning is not purely cognitive, and emotions influence cognitive processes such as attention and memory. Therefore, um, you know, uh, emotions, social, en social emotional engagement actually matters for learning. So learning is enhanced in child-friendly classrooms. And what does, um, what, what does a child-friendly classroom look, uh, look like? It has warm and responsive interactions between teachers and children. And the teacher is aware of the child's needs, moves, and interest, and the aware uh, the abilities. And the a teacher uses this awareness to guide his or her instruction with the child. And uh, child-friendly classrooms are inclusive of, ch of all children, and it cultivates a strong sense of community. 
Okay, so now I'm going to, um, I want to talk about um, some misconceptions. So the six pedagogical principles that I just presented are based on um, decades of accumulated research. But there have been some misconceptions about these principles. The first one is, uh, let me actually do this. So the first one is that structured pedagogy, including explicit instruction, is that it's a cell, um, student-centered instruction. It is also very well aligned with teacher professionalism. Um, explicit instruction sometimes have been um, conflated with the teacher-centered instruction, right? So teacher-centered instruction is where uh, the teacher is the center of knowledge. It is in The teacher is in charge of learning. But again, if you think, go back to the goal of explicit and systematic instruction is to help facilitate student learning. And in fact, all the principles that I presented are all based on actually the progress, the learning, student learning processes, right? The literature or scientific evidence about how people learn. So therefore, this explicit and systematic instruction principle is really a squarely student-centered, not teacher-centered. And it empowers teacher professionalism, right? It does not threaten teacher professionalism. In addition, um, uh, well, this has been actually brought up already in uh, when Adrian was talking, um, because this has been a topic for a while. Um, so structured pedagogy that we discussed is an overarching instructional framework that includes multiple principles that we just discussed, right? So implementing structured pedagogy requires teachers deep understanding of the content, so how reading skills develop, and pedagogical uh, principles, right, that we just discussed. So teacher knowledge is, of course, the teacher is the agent of teaching, right? So teacher knowledge is critical. But sometimes, you know, teachers uh, may lack depending on the context. So scripted lesson is just one tool or one way of supporting teachers to implement structured pedagogy. Because teachers also need explicit guidance and scaffolding and about how to and you know how to provide a structured pedagogy, effective instruction. So again, structured pedagogy is not the same as scripted lesson or a model lesson, nor um, can scripted lesson can replace uh, teacher training, right? Again, it's a one way or one tool to support teachers. Um, so the last misconception that I want to talk about is practice. Um, you know, sometimes practice has been confused with the drill uh, because they both involve repetitive practice on a target skill. But there's a critical uh, difference between these two and should be, uh, they should not be used interchangeably. So practice is a broad term referring to carefully prepared opportunities for rehearsing or reviewing or retrieving new, uh, newly learned material, right, to support learning. Drill, on the other hand, is mindless repetitive uh, repetition of, um, you know, task that is dull, also disengaging, right? So, you know, having children just simply copy, mindlessly they copy words off of the blackboard. That is an example of, of drill. Um, sometimes practice has been actually argued to um, interfere with uh, creativity or higher order thinking skills, but uh, research from cognitive um, science have, has shown that's not the case. It's actually the opposite. Practice is necessary for uh, building higher order thinking skills, right? Such as reading comprehension. Reading comprehension, language comprehension, all these are higher order thinking skills. And practice actually helps, uh, is actually needed to build these higher order skills. So um, in this session, I briefly uh, went over the six features of structured pedagogy based on a large review, uh, a review of a bar large body of evidence um, so, and I very much appreciate your attention and participation, and I would love to hear your thoughts and questions. As people take uh, a few minutes to write in any questions, comments, or, <clears throat> or experiences from their programs, 
I just wanted to share an observation with Dr. Kim from um, one of our participants that she appreciated the differentiation of feedback versus praise. Some of you may have mm. experienced as well, particularly for early grade teachers in context where teaching is socially perceived to be a very maternal-like task. And therefore teachers, women especially, are not expected to provide feedback but to praise. Perhaps you might comment on how we work with teachers to understand <clears throat> the difference between the two. Right. So feedback is on very specific tasks or the process, specific process on the task, right? So praise is, you know, so say, oh, uh, this is good, right? So if it is actually feedback, you would actually want to point out the child was reading, so for example, the word cat. The child, you know, kind of read the, the first part, cat, but, you know, kind of could not get the, uh, the final um, sound, right? The, could not decode the tooth part. Then you will say, oh, I love how the, uh, the way how um, you actually correctly read k, the letter C as k, and then the letter A, ah, that was very good. So remember, letter C here represents k sound, right? So you will be very, very specific. And then you would actually bring the child's attention to the last part. The child was not successful, the T part, right? So you would uh, say, well, do you remember this letter? This letter is T, and this makes t. -t sound right so let's try to together so you, you know effective feedback is again bringing the child's attention to the process and provide correct corrective feedback on that particular task for the given goal rather than just generic good you know excellent right so that doesn't actually really provide any feedback it's just a general praise right we've often received here at the global reading network in advance of some of our events and, and questions related to resources that people often wonder how teachers should be teaching formative or using what approaches they can use to teaching formative assessment um and i don't know dr kim and others as well if you could share what are the real practical ways that you've seen formative assessment play out uh in your in your classrooms you mentioned a few um and how we can maybe build on what teachers might already be doing to use those methods for assessing in the classroom the early grade reading skills. Right. I mean, so, you know, um, the table that I presented, there, there are type, different types of, right, uh, formative assessment. So, you know, on a daily basis when I teach, for example, right, so I teach, I go over a construct, I ask the students, right, so it's just to make sure the students follow what I'm talking about. That's, you know, checking in the, their mastery of the, what I just taught, right, so I, I'm sure uh, teachers do that every day, right, so and that's part of, um, you know, uh, the formative assessment, just to make sure the student is understanding what I just dis discussed or presented. That's kind of daily, on a daily basis, but if you implement more kind of a somewhat uh, a more systematic approach, you would initially, at the very beginning of the, you know, instruction, you would do screening for all students. Again, screening is a very brief on key skills. So um, kindergarten or first grade or year one, depending on the context, right? We know letter name knowledge is very important. We know logical awareness is important. So you would have a brief assessment, say five minutes, uh, you know, or maybe actually letter name influence, for example, a minute, right? So you assess children's how many letters kids know um, at the beginning and just kind of like a check, check, check for all the students and you would group them instruction instructionally for some students who do not know actually any letters at all you would have put them together and for the students who know of a few letters you put them together as a small group and those students who know quite a few letters you put them together sorry <laughs> that was a call um, so so then so you would provide instructions in that small group and then, so you, for especially for the group who actually were struggling, who didn't have uh, knowledge of many letters, you would actually monitor the progress. So after teaching letters, say, you know, a few letter, a couple of letters, right? And then you would monitor, you know, maybe in a week or in a couple of weeks, see whether they actually know those letters. That's progress monitoring. And you would do that on a regular basis. And then, and when the interval becomes a little longer, that's benchmark, 
right? So after uh, the first trimester, let's see how much, you know, these children have learned in the key skills, such as, again, letter knowledge, phonological awareness, or word reading. And let's see if they have, you know, meet, you know the, uh, met the goal by that time point. So that's benchmark, right? So a lot of teachers do do uh, the the mastery learning in their the, uh, daily instruction. Um, it's just employing uh, the other pieces, um, screening, benchmark, all those pieces. May, that may be a little bit more formal. Does that make sense? I mean, the, did I answer the question? Yeah, I think those are helpful suggestions. Uh, adding on to that, we were talking earlier about what to do in large classrooms, and we hear this over and over. How can teachers really yeah. assess all the children in a in a large classroom. Do you have any suggestions specific to that? Absolutely. I mean, that's a huge challenge. Um, so, you know, so assessments are, you know, when you have a large class, that's definitely um, a challenge. Um, so brief assessment uh, is definitely helpful. And a screening and progress monitoring tools that definitely usually very brief, you know, usually a, a task takes about, you know, a minute or two. And what I recommend typically is, you know, do a few kids uh, every day. So assessing, say, 60, 70 kid, uh, children, right, at all at once, that's, that's going to take a lot of time. So I would do, uh, you know, a, what, a week or two in the beginning of the year for screening, for example. I'll work with, uh, you know, a few kids every day. Um, that will actually uh, get me going, right, instead of taking a whole lot chunk of time at once. So that's in terms of assessment, working with a large number of children. In terms of instruction, I mean, a lot of people have suggested really great ideas. Um, one idea is pairing children up with, you know, um, uh, skilled readers and some less skilled readers. Um, and then the skilled reader helps out the less skilled reader. The key there is that young children do not know how the um, school year, I would spend a lot of time on how to work with each other. So skilled reader, when the skilled reader is helping with the less skilled reader, how do you interact with each other, right? Or, so that's one way, pairing up um, children. Another way is, you know, like dividing the group into two large groups, right? I mean, ideally, your instruction, differentiated instruction will be a small group of, the, say, children of four and five, but sometimes practically that's not feasible. If that's the case, you would actually create two large groups and conduct um, instruction based on their needs in, in, the, in that two groups. Concluding thoughts for this session, I'd like to thank Dr. Kim very much for that in-depth look at structured pedagogy and, for, and assess, formative assessment. Um, we'll now transition back to Dr. Barnes, who will just walk us through some, some key takeaways uh, that we hope you leave with, us, leave with today. Okay, so key takeaways. Um, sure. so what we really need to address, right, or what we really need to think about when we're thinking about early grading skills that children need to learn, and how do we instruct them? Well, there is a large body of evidence, as Dr. Kim mentioned, that provides guidance on effective instructional strategies for teaching early grade reading skills. We definitely need to remember that children progress through these developmental stages, and these stages should be reflected in our scope and sequence of the curriculum, and we have to remember what, at what stage children are in when we're expecting them to complete activities and reflect on are they developmentally ready to engage in those types of activities. Classroom-based assessment is an essential component of instruction. Um, when teachers understand how to use formative assessment, then they can use that data to improve their instruction, to improve what they're giving the children and they they can also use that information to help guide and figure out how to how to change their instruction what children need more support how they can maybe better group their students or group in different ways like dr kim was talking about um, and that we need to make sure that we're providing inclusive and equitable opportunities for girls for children with disabilities for other children with specific learning needs or maybe specific deficits that they come to class with um, lower skills than everyone else. Um, I think that there's, a, there's a, 
a plethora, a wealth of information in this uh, PowerPoint. And um, these are just some of the few key takeaways that, that really moving forward we need to consider. For, for more information, the landscape report on early grade literacy um, is available for download and it's also going to be on the reference list that you receive. Uh, Dr. Kim was one of the authors in writing this report. It addresses many of the early grade reading skills, how they should be instructed and how they can be textual, contextualized to um, developing country contexts across the world. I want to add to uh, what Adrian has said. Uh, so the white papers on structured pedagogy and the formative assessment will be available soon. And uh, I hope that, that will, uh, those will be uh, uh, helpful resources. Thank you. Thank you both um, for the presentations. And we know these are enormous topics that you know, we have graduate level courses about. So there's a lot to learn. Uh, in the meantime, we invite you to register for the three sessions that are remaining, the one on language, the next on teacher professional development and coaching, and thinking about planning issues and scale up and sustainability of programs. So if you do have questions, feel free to always reach out to the Global Reading Network. Our, our general email address can be found on our newsletter, other communications, and on our website. And if you are inclined to be on social media, here's how you can also follow, follow us on different platforms and we have been tweeting about the event today and if you can retweet and share and help other colleagues around the world learn about these webinars we appreciate it very much so thank you again and have a good rest of your day or evening bye-bye